Amiga, do you ever feel caught between two worlds? You cherish your cultural background, but sometimes it clashes with the realities of raising a family in modern America. You might feel pressured to fulfill traditional expectations, yet you crave a life that allows you to be your true authentic self. If you're a Latina mom nodding your head right now, I see you and I get it. Balanced Madrehood is more than your average mommy coaching program. It's a supportive comunidad designed specifically for you. I understand the unique challenges you face navigating between generations and culturas while forging your own path as a mama. Stop feeling like you have to choose between your roots and your future. Balanced Motherhood empowers you to create a life that celebrates your heritage, embraces your motherhood journey, and prioritizes your own happiness. Spots are limited. Don't miss out on this opportunity to connect with a supportive community and create a more balanced life. Visit the link in the show notes to join the waitlist for the next Balanced Motherhood cohort. I can't wait to meet you. You're listening to the Viva La Mami podcast, a podcast about all things motherhood. I'm your host, Jessica Cuevas. I am a mother of one on a mission to redefine the meaning of motherhood as a first-generation, bilingual, and bicultural Latina mommy. Regardless if we feel like a failure from time to time, or if we succeeded with the little things in our motherhood journey, it is important to celebrate all of these experiences as madres. So, bring your cafecito, as I invite you to be a part of this space and create raw and honest conversations about the exciting and challenging parts of being a mommy. Ahora, vámonos. Hola, hola, amiga. Today we are welcoming Deandra Morse from Bilingual Playdate. Deandra is a Dominican American Afro Latina licensed clinical social worker raised in both the Dominican Republic and New York City. Deandra currently lives in upstate New York and is raising two Spanish English bilingual boys alongside her husband, who's a non native speaker of Spanish. She has over 10 years of experience in trauma treatment child advocacy, and identifying the social-emotional needs of children and their families. Following her passion for supporting children and families, Deandra created Bilingual Playdate, an Instagram account dedicated to parents and educators for bilingual children. Deandra uses her Bilingual Playdate platform to highlight resources available to parents and educators of bilingual children, provide education around language variations and linguistic oppression, and support the intentional use of Spanish indoors and outdoors via Spanish vocabulary cheat sheets and play-based ideas, which I definitely used with D. Deandra and I had such an impactful conversation about raising bilingual children as first generation or one and a half generation Latinas in the United States and how we should give ourselves grace in this journey. She shares great tips que hasta me dejó con la boca abierta. I'm sure you will leave with so much empowerment after you listen to our conversation and leave with some tools as you're raising bilingual children. Now, here is my interview with Deandra Morse from Bilingual Playdate. Hola, hola, Deandra. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien. ¿Y tú? Bien. Gracias. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I am just really excited because I've been following your page through my personal account, but also like now through Viva La Mami. And I think the work that you're doing is so impactful and very helpful for many Latina mommies out there. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. So thank you. So before I kind of go into and delve into the conversation about bilingualism and raising bilingual kids, I would like to first know a little bit more about you. So tell me about yourself, where you live, your family, and what is it that you currently do? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It's such an honor. 
Thank you. So my Thank name you. is Sandra Morse. I am a licensed clinical social worker in New York State. I live in upstate New York, near Syracuse. That's usually, everyone knows Syracuse University. So near Syracuse, I have a private practice where I see clients in our community and I provide therapy, but I also run Bilingual Playdate, which is an, it's a brand that focuses on advocating, educating, and everything that has to do with parenting bilingual children and encouraging parents to to get educated really and to know, get clear on their goals, get clear on what kind of bilingualism journey they wanna be on and find community and empowerment in, in being in, in this bilingual play date community. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm sure it's a busy schedule for you on a day-to-day -day basis because you're still practicing and then you mm -hmm. obviously oversee your social media account and, and it's been very, you know, I've been following you for some time and it's just thriving and it is great and, and it is telling that there is a need, right, mm -hmm. about education and kind of awareness about bilingualism, you know, and I don't know about you, but I grew up in the 90s where oftentimes it's like, okay, you are being brought up bilingual, mm -hmm. but there wasn't really a strategy. I really don't know what my parents really did to raise to make me. This happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I do know Spanish, you know, that it, Spanish was my first language, but mm -hmm. now I'm mostly predominant English. But now that I have a son and, and even before pregnancy, I was like, okay, I know that I want to raise our children bilingual. But what is the right way? Is there a right way? Is there an actual method? Right. And so one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, like, is there a strategy involved or is it just like, oh, aquí estamos con el abuelito y la abuelita and we're just going to speak Spanish. Right. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I grew up in the Dominican Republic and my parents, literally their strategy was like, they sent me to school and my school was bilingual. And so I learned English in school. Yeah. Through school, their strategy was we speak Spanish in our house and we live in a DR. And so that's going to be what we do. But I don't think that they were conscious at all. Like when I talk to them about strategies, about raising bilingual children, they're like, what? <laughs> they they don't really, it's not the same, you know, obviously both of my parents spoke Spanish, my spouse and I both speak Spanish, but he kind of took on it. So we started our parenting journey and it wasn't something, it was something that we knew we wanted to do, but it wasn't something that we were like super specific or clear or intentional about because my parents di didn't have a plan. So I didn't have that point of reference. And so it wasn't until later that I was more like, okay, there has to be like a strategy or like a way to do this, you know? So I'm just going to speak Spanish to my kids and then see what happens. And so then, so that's kind of how I started my own journey. But then late, that's actually one of the reasons why I started Bilingual Play Day was because I didn't have any orientation as to mm -hmm. how to raise bilingual children, especially in upstate New York, which is very different than New York City. So when I say New York, everyone's like, oh, it's so easy it's in the city. And I'm like, no, I don't live in the city. I live in upstate New York. And so in upstate New York, I don't have as much access to a Spanish speaking community. And so I didn't really know or had any guidance. So I started my bilingual play date and I got connected to, so these are the two accounts that I think everyone should follow if they're raising bilingual children and are looking for like strategies. And I'll explain why these accounts are like saving grace. So Bilinguitos, Kayla Diaz, and Billy Kids underscore DE, Rebecca Inberg. So they both are, they study social linguistics, they're linguists, and their area of study is how to preserve language and family bilingualism, family language policy. And so, and those are big words, but basically what that means is that there are strategies to raise bilingual children. And, and I can tell you some of them. So one of the most popular ones are one parent, one language. So one parent speaks English and one parent speaks Spanish. And a lot of times that's very popular because it's kind of in the United States, it's kind of taboo to raise kids kind of the way my parents did, where they did minority language at home, but mm -hmm. Spanish wasn't a minority language in the Dominican Republic. But when we moved to the United States, they continue on with Spanish. So right. that's kind of more rare to do minority language at home. 
But actually what I found in my community is that, that it's not as rare and that it is actually a great strategy if you're able to do it. And even if your partner is not fully fluent, like my husband isn't fully fluent, you still can do minority language at home. And so those are kind of like the two big ones. Another strategy is time and place. So you choose when you're speaking the language. So let's say a family can speak English maybe most of the time, but then some, but most of the time, but then they have designated times carved out where they're going to be speaking Spanish or French or whatever language they have chosen. But I love to connect people with Kayla and Rebecca. And that's one of the things that Bilingual Playdate does. Like it's a community that hubs other resources so that parents can do this journey in the best way. But I, I love connecting with them because they can give you access to the research, but also what is your plan? Because not everyone's plan is bilingual and biliterate children. Like some people just want to expose their child to another language, or they just want them to be able to communicate some with the abuelitos, but it's not like full fluency. And so the more clear we are, the better we can know what strategy to choose versus just winging it. Because it doesn't work to just wing it in the U.S. And it doesn't work. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yeah, I had this preconceived notion that you expose these children with abuelito, abuelita, they're going to learn the language, y se les va a grabar, right? Everything mm -hmm. is going to be so because ingrained. Because they're sponges. Right, they're sponges. Mm -hmm. But once they start school, and if they don't go to like a dual language or bilingual program, and English is exclusively spoken 100% in the classroom, they may lose the language. And even though they're still bilingual, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have these expectations of them speaking it back to you when you're conversating, mm -hmm. you know, they're not going to be proficient or they're not going to feel comfortable in speaking mm -hmm. the language. Um, and so, yeah, so it's it's always like, I always feel like we get a bunch of like backlash from older generations. It's like, mm -hmm. well, you know, we raised them bilingual or we raised them in like full Spanish, but it's like, well, there's actually strategies and, mm -hmm. you know, different methods involved and intentionality too, right? Like mm -hmm. what is your intention when you're raising a bilingual child? But there's so much to learn, right? Like there's so there many is. resources. And so I do appreciate you sharing bilinguitos and bilingual kids. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and so I'll make those sure. are good ones. Yeah, so I will, yes. yeah, and you'll, I know you'll include it, but I'll also share their handles because they are lit, like everyone. So like my community, we talk about like the grind, like the everyday of bilingual parenting, but they are the ones that like can set you up so that you know what your grind is mm -hmm. because mine is biliterate and bilingual and so the things that I may choose to do may not be something that someone else chooses to do and a lot of times you know I've had conversations where people are like oh my god it feels like a sacrifice like raising bilingual kids and I'm like mm. it, it can feel like a sacrifice but anything that we want is really inconvenient like so my best analogy to explain my own bilingual goals is that if I wanted my child to get a scholarship a full ride to play at SU at our university basketball I would have to do so much so that that happens I would have to get them into a basketball league make sure that they're training make sure that they're practicing in the summer they're doing camp they're doing goal you know travel teams they're doing all kinds of things so that they can get better at their skill they're not just going to get accepted into the, the university without being the best of the best and so but if bilingual parenting is kind of the same, you have to, if it's something that you want, you'll find that the things that you have to do to achieve it in the way that you want it, that are just like if you wanted your child to, to get a full ride for something that they're really good at. And so, yes. yeah, it, it, it's any goal, you know, if you want to lose weight, if you want to learn how to sing, if you want to learn how to cook, like you have to make time in your schedule and, and make it so it's a part of your life. And so- right. So the abuelitos and putting that pressure on the abuelitos doesn't really work because they're not, they can't be there. I mean, some people have a really nice setup where their parent is like living with them. And I wish mm -hmm. my mom lived with us. That would be <laughs> amazing input. And she comes and stays with us for like weeks. And that's always great for our family. But realistically, that's not, that's not realistic for a lot of families. And so thinking that the, the kids will just get it through the grandparents 
it would be nice, but it's not always possible and a lot goes into it. And I think that that's the part that our communities don't really understand. And I think our, the abuelitos don't understand. They're like, how, why doesn't it happen? Why do they, why are they not speaking, in, uh, why are they speaking English to me and not Spanish? And it's like, well, their days are in English and they don't have mm-hmm. enough Spanish input to like balance it out. Right. Yeah. And it's almost like a long term, Mm -hmm. you know, gradual experience. It's not just like an early, early childhood when they're just like being immersed in the very beginning to like toddlerhood, like the language still continues on. And yeah, you are so right. I think there is a lot of pressure on both ends, I feel like, because Mm -hmm. the older generation, they want to cultivate, you know, the language. But then the new generation, it's like, "Eh, I don't know where to go because modern parenting has like so much load, you know, how to be a good parent, how to be a good bilingual parent, and then how to be like good at all of these different, Mm -hmm. you know, aspects of parenting that it's like, it, it, is it is very overwhelming i would say i even get yeah. overwhelmed and i have a 20 i get old. overwhelmed <laughs> yeah and i'm like oh, how do you do this <laughs> yeah. um, and you did talk about the mental load of mm-hmm. bilingual parents so can you kind of tell us a little bit more about that i think it's very intriguing of what you have stated on social media but for those that are not familiar with you like what is that definition or explanation about it mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I'm a therapist by trade and, you know, and so I want it. So my private practice and bilingual plated are separate, but obviously you can't really take the therapist out of it. And so one of the things that I started noticing was that a lot of parents in the bilingual community were feeling pressured and guilt and shame and Mm -hmm. feeling all these feelings around everything about their journey, you know, and it's like anything in parenting. It's like whether your kid is sleeping enough or eating enough. And so I just started noticing and it wasn't something that people were talking about. So I started kind of wanting to educate more um, in a way that was very to the point. And so I started doing these graphics that were the you know, the invisible load of bilingual parenting. And then I would do like a specific thing. So like holiday edition, and I'll probably have that up soon Mm -hmm. where in the holidays, you know, you, even if you're not saying it, you'll go to a family gathering and whether that is a family gathering where there are Spanish speakers or English speakers, you as a parent that's bilingual and is trying to figure out your bilingual journey, you feel some type of way, whether it is someone makes a comment about your child's Spanish or your child's English, or whether you get a question about, oh, when are they going to school so they can learn whatever language, you know, like all those little comments that people make and sometimes out of curiosity or like wanting to connect with you. Sometimes when we're feeling sensitive about something or unsure about something, they just hit differently. And so I wanted to kind of bring awareness to like, you're not alone. We are thinking the same things. We are feeling the same things. And we still want to do this journey because it means something. And so when we have really defined goals as to why we want to raise bilingual children, I think we can acknowledge those mental, the mental load that we're carrying. And we can say, and it's still worth it to me. And it's still something that I want to do. Or we can say, no, this is too much. And I need help. And I need to figure out a different way to balance this load. And one of the things that I talked about early on on my account was that a lot of times the moms are the ones carrying the load. And that was something that was very fascinating to me. I mean, moms can do it all, but (laughs) it was something that I was like, even when the mom is not the native speaker, the mom was carrying the bilingual journey. And I thought that was fascinating. And so I started kind of challenging that for some of the parents that were following me and saying like, it's called, so when you work with Kayla and you work with um, Rebecca, you get to develop a family language plan. And so I said, like, it's called a family language plan, not a mother language plan. And so, Mm -hmm. so the mom shouldn't be carrying all the responsibility, unless you have clearly defined that you're only doing one person, one language. And in that case, then the mom is doing her language and not the the dad's. And so it was kind of like a call to action for moms to also find a way to have conversations with their partners about their own bilingual parenting goals and finding a way for the family to have more of a 
fluid way to go about it because bilingualism isn't fixed and there's going to be seasons of life where our kids are going to be more, our kids are going to be English dominant no matter what, because they are living and breathing English, but it doesn't mean that the, what we're doing in Spanish isn't going to work also, or isn't as valuable. And so we have to find that balance. And that's why I wanted to kind of shine light to the bilingual parenting mental load, because it's heavy. It's very yeah. heavy. Yeah. It is very heavy. And especially for first gen, second gen mm -hmm. folks here in the US, there's this kind of like high expectation about us. Like, so I identify mm -hmm. as first gen. I'm like 1.5, but That's I identify first generation. Yeah. yeah, it's kind mm -hmm. of like a weird. Um, yeah, we're like in the MBC. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But I feel, I often feel that you have to reach this level of perfectionism, mm -hmm. right? And this, this could be me also being the firstborn. But también, I think it's this like high expectation that our parents have about us, like, mm -hmm. oh, you should go to school, you know, you should do this and this and that. And I feel like my way of giving back is like, okay, I'm going to kind of fully immerse my child into our cultura and our mm -hmm. language. But for me, I've caught myself where I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know these words. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm learning with my son as well. Mm -hmm. And so how do you find this way of like being okay with not being 100% fluent or 100 mm -hmm. or have this 100% Spanish, you know, vocabulary so that we wouldn't like hurt ourselves or even like hurt our past generations. Right. Yeah. So like, yeah, I think that really resonates a lot with the, the mental load, you know, that that many bilingual parents go through. And so I don't know if that's something that your followers also express. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that, okay, so one of the things that I feel like the 1.5, which is us, feel <laughs> is that we can't let bilingualism die in our generation. Like, like we can't be the generation that drops the ball on bilingualism. Yeah. I feel like there's this pressure to like continue to carry it on because our parents sacrifice a lot to make it so that we are bilingual. And so to think that our kids are not, it's like a very hard um, possibility to sit with. And so we kind of deal with that. But one of the things that I've learned in in just my own bilingual parenting journey is to give myself grace. And I feel like I've learned that from my husband because he's Americano. So he mm -hmm. like knew some Spanish and I always knew that he knew from like high school and college but we never spoke to each other in Spanish and he kind of took on the language when the pandemic hit because I was home and I was only speaking Spanish to our child and so our child started talking and he was like well I'm not going to be not participating like I'll just do it and I learned from him like he'll say things and he it he doesn't like like stop himself when he doesn't know a word. He just like goes around it or figures it out. And I, it helped me give myself grace. Like look at him, like learning, you know, and he's so gracious about whether even if he makes a mistake or doesn't conjugate properly, like he doesn't like children, like they don't skip a beat. They don't care. And so I kind of learned to like give myself grace. And I love, this is one thing that I love, like as a therapist in general, I love telling kids, So I work with kids and I work with families, but I love telling kids, like, I don't know, like, can you teach me? Like, I'm old. I don't know. You tell me like when they start telling me about like the vibe in their school and they say new words, I'm like, I have no idea what you're saying. Can you tell me about it? And kids love when adults say that they don't know things. And so I've, oh, I've used that with my three and a half year old and my two year old. I'm like, I have no idea. Can we look it up? And we go on the phone and we look it up. And so my three and a half year old will be like, mommy, or if my husband says something that he also doesn't know in Spanish, he'll say it in English. My, my three and a half year old is like, okay, como se dice en español entonces? Let's look it up. And so we, we like go and look it up. And, and I feel like that's number one. We have to give ourselves grace. First of all, modern parenting is so different than back in the day. My parents did not sit and like play with me or read books to me. My parents were great parents, but that was not part of their parenting. They did not They did not read books to me. And I read yeah, so many books to my kids. Like that was not a thing at all. And so I don't, it, it makes sense that I don't know some of the words because we didn't sit and play kitchen. And we didn't, I had, I'm one of four. And so I have siblings and my parent, and I'm a middle child. So my, or sort of middle child, I guess, if you have four, but second to last. So my parents were like, go play with your 
with your sibling, like mm-hmm. there's four of you, you know, like go do something. And so I think modern parenting, we've taken on more of the one-to-one. And I think the pandemic also forced us yes. to kind of be more in the one-to-one versus that wasn't the way that our parents parented. And so it makes sense that we have gaps in our language. And then it makes sense that we have more gaps because we have more educational years in English than we have in Spanish at this point. And even I, who grew up in the Dominican Republic predominantly, I did go to school for a couple of years in New York, but then I moved back. But then I graduated high school in New York and then did my college and master's here. Now I have, I have almost the same I moved when I was 16 and I'm turning 32. So like I mm-hmm. half and half of my life, I lived in both places. And so, yeah, like I think it's so easy for us to not know those things and we need to give ourselves grace and look it up with your child. And they yeah. love that. They love to hear that. Like, oh, mommy doesn't know. Okay, let's look it up. Yeah. 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 I know that many of us and even myself included, like I think that we put ourselves in this very you know, just like weird position of trying to be perfect, you know, Mm -hmm. trying to like cultivate the language. And it's almost like it's our responsibility, but knowing that it's okay to be imperfect and also Mm -hmm. finding the resources, like whatever you are looking for, hopefully there are some answers, but you are so right about looking, you know, just like words together. I think that that Mm -hmm. is kind of like a mutual educational experience. And I'm sure that it's very empowering for the, for your kids to also learn with you. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's also like when they go to school, then that's something that's already a habit of yours. So when they come to from school and they say like, oh, this word, if you want to incorporate some Spanish to the schooling that they're getting, you can be like, oh, I wonder how you say that in Spanish. Let's look it up. And it's already a habit that you've built in before school kind of takes over with English. And it's Mm -hmm. something, I don't know, I feel like it's such a bonding experience. And sometimes we'll go and look at images. So I'll learn new words. And that's kind of why I also started making like cheat sheets on bilingual play day where I show people different words that they can use when they're playing with their kid but the thing that happens with language in general is that there are a lot of variations Mm -hmm. so it's very hard to make a resource or to provide people with a resource that says this is how you say it because that's not true depending on where you live there's different words and so that's why it's also very nice to look it up because you can literally look up how do you say this in the Dominican Republic or Mm -hmm. you know or or you can use that time so I've also done it where I call my dad or I call my mom Mm -hmm. and I then and then I ask them how do you say this and then my child gets to learn from them even though they're not here with us and I find that that is such a it's like a cute bonding experience like oh I learned something from abuelo or abuela And because mommy didn't know, but they did know. And so there's good ways to incorporate that family dynamic to also give your bilingualism more of a purpose. Mm, I love that. And you are so right about, yeah, including other family members right outside the Mm -hmm. home. And and I think that is very important. And you speak a lot about that as well, especially with Grupo Play, which I, Mm -hmm. I do follow them as, which is part of Bilinguitos. So how do you encourage bilingualism outside the home when Spanish is basically minoritized, right? It's the minority language outside the home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we continue to speak Spanish no matter where we are, no matter who's there, no matter what's happening, we continue to speak Spanish. And one of the things that I've noticed is that the more I speak Spanish outside of the home, one, the more comfortable I am. I don't, I don't even, I mean, when your kids like are, my children are little, so I have to pay attention to them like 100% of the time when I'm out with them. So I don't even have time to know or see if someone is giving me like a bad look for speaking Spanish. But what I have noticed is that when someone does know something in Spanish, they say it when they hear us say, saying something in Spanish. So we've been in the grocery store and we've heard someone say like, oh, hola, como están? Even though they don't like fully speak Spanish, but they knew that phrase. And so they say that to my kids and it's a way to encourage bilingualism by, by mm-hmm. saying like, you know, when we walk away, I'm like, oh my God, did you, do it, do it que te dijo hola? And then we talk about that experience and how other people know the language too. And some people know it a little bit, but some people know more and, and it's an opportunity to 
to show our kids that the language is alive and it doesn't just, you know, it's not just something that we do. It's something that many people do. And so that's kind of how I encourage is just by not hiding it because I never want my child to think or, or feel that it's not as valuable. Another thing we do is we were, so I helped Kayla from Bilinguitos, I help her design some of the shirts that she sells to. So my kids wear their Bilinguitos shirts all the time. And that's one way that I find, because you can always find cute shirts that say things in English, but you can never, or it's very rare to find something outside of the Latino Hispanic Heritage Month to find something that that represents your cultura or your child. And so for school, my my kid wears their shirt every every time they go to school they just like wear it and then i i have found little ways to incorporate bilingualism into their classroom by donating bilingual books into the classroom oh, and offering great. and offering to volunteer to come to for story time to talk and so even when i've gone into the classroom i speak spanish to my kid and then the other kids get to hear it as like oh you know, this is something that exists because one of the things that I have found is that every time I'm in a playground and other children will approach me and and say, why are you speaking like that? Because they've never been exposed to it. So they'll say, why are you speaking like that? I'm like, oh, I'm speaking another language. It's called Spanish. I'm bilingual. And they're like, oh, what is that? Tell me more about that. They're like, what is this? Mind blown. Mind blown. I'm like, oh my God, I'm teaching someone's child something. And so I tell them about it. And I'm like, yeah, so my, my kids can speak Spanish and English. So they know two languages and they're like, oh my God, so cool. And it's also something fun for my kids to see that they see me actively be bilingual by speaking to them in Spanish and the other child in English. And then to like, you know, kind of brag about it so that the other kids see it as something positive because we never know, you know, there are negative associations sometimes with speaking the language outside. And I want to do my part in fighting back on that. So if we, I believe that we, there's a lot of us. And if all Mm -hmm. of us embrace our language outside of our homes and we're proud of it and found ways to, to really uplift the language maybe the way that other people see our language would change versus I think sometimes because of fear we assimilate so much that that we lose the language because we don't want to be othered oh gosh there is a lot to unpack there because (laughs) everything speaks like so true like Thank you so much for for sharing that. There, that's just like a lot of I'm I'm like at a loss of words to be honest because I'm like trying to reflect on my experience. And granted, I have a little one, right? He's mm-hmm. he's 20 months old, but I'm being very intentional about our language. And I feel like you know I'm creating a safe haven in our home where we're speaking to him like predominantly. But there are some times where we add a little bit of Spanglish, you know, and and my husband and I mostly talk English to each other. So it's just the blend of things. I feel like we Mm -hmm. don't have one specific strategy. But once we go outside, I mean, it depends on where we take him, right? So if Mm -hmm. it's at Abuelita Abuelita's house or even Tio Tia, they do speak all Spanish. Like it's also, he's also being immersed. Mm -hmm. But then when I hang out with my very close friends who are white, Mm -hmm. that mommy flips the switch as well. I really appreciate you sharing that because it's almost like I'm er not intentionally erasing our Mm -hmm. language, but it's like, oh, mommy's speaking me in English when she only speaks to me in Spanish. Mm -hmm. It's a message to them. They are like, what what is that about? The kids don't, so like, one of the things that is beautiful about children and childhood is like they're they're not abstract thinkers. So they don't they don't know the nuances, so they don't understand, but they are very concrete. So they will kind of walk away from like, okay, in this setting, this happens, and in this setting, this happens. And then eventually they're like, what's that about? Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, what should I be doing that? And then they start kind of thinking about it, but it's not a very like conscious process, like what me and you are doing, talking about it, but it happens over time. And so a lot of times kids do get confused 
by the way that we behave sometimes when it comes to bilingualism, unless we talk about it, which you could do. You could, you know, you can, even if your your son's little, but you can still say, you know, papi, cuando, cuando vamos a donde mis amigas, vamos a hablar en inglés porque ellas no saben, no saben español. Like you can do that, but it's when we don't talk about it that then they get to their own conclusions about the value that we have towards the language, which isn't always true like isn't always that we don't value our language it's maybe that we want we don't know if our friends are going to be comfortable you know and we don't want to have that conversation with them because what if they are uncomfortable and then what do we do you know then it's like is the friendship going to change and so I think that that is one of the things that is hard to navigate like how do we honor our family's bilingual plan and also continue to connect with the people that we love and have been connecting. But I think about it kind of back to my sports analogy. If I wanted my child to play basketball at Syracuse University, I wouldn't bring, I don't know that I would bring him to a place where, to a gym that they couldn't play basketball. Right. You know, or that that playing basketball would be frowned upon or that they would be told they needed to play soccer. Because if my plan is that they're going to do this, then I don't know that I would bring them there or I would tell that gym, my child needs to be able to play play basketball if you want me to come. You know, and so I think about it in that way, but it's hard. It's hard to know like what the right answer is and so many nuances to dealing with the same thing. Yes, there's so many nuances, but I do appreciate you sharing that you have consistency, right? And Mm -hmm. intentionality of your approach, like the fact that you bring bilingual books to your children's classrooms like that is like so empowering just because, you know, we, I'm very, again, I'm intentional at home of like Mm -hmm. exposing my son with all these different bilingual books, but then what happens outside of the home, right? Mm -hmm. Even in our library, I feel like we're so limited with bilingual books. I know. we live in a very diverse community here in the the suburbs of Chicago. And I'm like, what is going on? (laughs) So yeah, I, I am scared I think Mm -hmm. and I feel like this is an intervention here which by no means but I hope that my (laughs) listeners are also having the same sentiment but I I am afraid that he's gonna lose the language because Mm -hmm. of everything that he's gonna be exposed to outside of the home but I do appreciate that you are a part of your children's day-to-day obviously the things that you can control and and they're still little but there's a lot of consistency and intentionality you have which is great yeah and I I mean I think that teachers are wonderful I love public education there isn't always the best support for teachers in how to best serve bilingual children Mm -hmm. and so one of the things that I advocate is on education on the parent side but also on the educator side but sometimes if a teacher has so much going on and lack of support they literally can't and and it it humbles me because I remember you know when I was a a young social worker like starting my career I didn't know everything and I had very complicated cases that I needed to navigate so I had to do I I took it upon myself to learn on my own time but I had that flexibility because I didn't have children then and I didn't have like a lot of things going on and I don't know and so I, I I think about it that way like I don't know what the teacher's life outside of school because they have a life outside of school is and I have a lot of teachers teacher friends and so one of the things that I have done is asking them like how can I like without micromanaging the teacher Mm -hmm. help so that she can also she or he can also know that this is something that's important to me and I want it to be nurtured to the best of their abilities and that was the that was one of the things that they told me like you can donate books you can offer to go for story time like Mm -hmm. teachers love like you know you can offer to go through the process of subbing like there's so many things there's so many ways to get involved in the school that we sometimes don't know and so we don't do them but we can be volunteering we and to to show because if I go to the school and I'm volunteering I'm going to speak Spanish to my kid and then Mm -hmm. that's one way that another child gets exposed to bilingualism and that's some w- a way that in that space I have made a mark like I'm bilingual and my child will be bilingual and this is how it's going to be done and I think that it's hard it's hard to navigate that system when it's outside of our home but there are little ways that we can do one of the things I've talked about before is like with the library 
we can we could all make a list of our favorite bilingual books and give that to the librarian and the librarian will order those books and but it's hard to like ask or we can ask to run a bilingual story time or a Spanish story time and ask a friend to come or ask our friends to come so that the librarian can see or the library can see that this is something that the community wants. But sometimes I think this is a cultural thing. Yeah. I don't, I don't think this is a thing to go to the library. <laughs> like, I think this yeah. is like modern parenting, but like our families, my parents didn't bring me to the library. So I feel like this is something new that we're also dealing and learning with. So a lot of times I think that the resources are disproportionate because white families or American born and raised families go to the library and use the library as a resource but latino families hispanic families don't have the same story time connection warm and fuzzy feeling around the library or reading in general and so we don't think to do those things and so there's not that many resources so it's almost like on us to like make that happen for us if we want our kids to feel represented when they go to the library Mm. Thank you so much for sharing, because that is such a great educational piece for us to kind of ask ourselves, okay, what are the resources available at our local libraries and how can I yeah. be involved? Yeah, that is very helpful. Yeah. Oh, there's just, I, I can't, oh my gosh. <laughs> I think that you have so much wisdom and, and information about all of this. And we have picked up on a little bit about bilingual play date, but just to kind of allow space for your platform. What inspired you to create bilingual play date? Bilingual play date started May 2020. The pandemic happened in March and I had recently became a stay at home mom. I was doing my private practice virtually and I wanted like an outlet where I could talk about my bilingualism because I no longer had like a team of other therapists that I could like talk about my day to day. And so kind of Instagram became like my little community where I was sharing kind of how we were fostering Spanish more intentionally via play. And so via play, via connection, being very purposeful about the books that were at our home, the toys that we were playing with, like everything became about how to raise a bilingual child. And so that's kind of how Bilingual Playdate started. And then it kind of progressed to be this what it is now, which is kind of last year in November, I rem- oh, October, November, I remember saying, I want to talk about the bilingual parenting mental load. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of started sharing about that. And then more and more traction was, I found like that those posts were getting a lot of traction. And so they really resonated with a lot of people. And then it led me to feeling like I needed to do more education and more advocacy. And it kind of lit another So I went to school for community problem solving within the realm of social work. And so bilingual parenting kind of reignited that fire in me of like wanting to address problems in communities. And so for bilingual parenting, the main problem is the devaluing of our language and our culture and our heritage that we constantly face by well-intended comments that are made about our bilingual parenting journey. And so that kind of became my, the umbrella that I kind of fall under. And so bilingual play date took all of that. And it's been a very humbling experience, just being able to talk about something that I feel passionate about. And I get to connect with other people who are going through the same things that I'm going through. And we can find, you know, we can find connection in that we're all doing it and we're giving it the best that we, like the, we're giving it our all and we're doing the best that we can with the information that we know, just like our parents did. Our parents did the best that they could with what they knew and we're doing the best that we, we can with what we know. Yes, absolutely. And I think that your page is so valuable. I mean, there's so many pieces of information that I've gathered that now I'm practicing and using in in my raising my child. So thank you so much. I think it's just very helpful, especially like you said, if we want to pass down the the culture, right, the language, we want to make sure that we also do our own 
duty, right, to mm -hmm. to be educated, to be well aware about ourselves and recognize, like you said, give ourselves grace and also being intentional of how we're raising our bilingual children. So I really, really appreciate this. And your platform is so valuable. And I wish you the very best. I could already see it thriving even more. So it's always exciting to see folks in this space and, and creating community, because that is essentially the, the purpose as mm -hmm. well, you know, to create community. Yeah. And so one question that I have is what would you advise parents to be who would want to raise a bilingual child? My best advice is kind of talking about it and figuring out what is why your why and your how far are you willing to take it and how much are you willing to sacrifice and it's back to kind of it's like bilingualism is my sport at my house mm -hmm. it's what it's what we plan around and it really dictates the whether we have a play date whether we go here whether we go there if we're traveling are we gonna you know I, it, it dictates a lot and so and I that's my my go-to advice and then my second advice is like definitely find community and if, if whether in person or virtual so there's so many people on the Instagram community that are such good sources of information and support. And I'm, I'm happy to be kind of the bridge and connect people with each other. And so, yeah, so follow me if you're like expecting a, bi a bilingual child because yeah. bilingualism starts in the womb. Like we yes. can, you know, I used to play music, Spanish music to my kids in the womb and I used to read books and I used to do all these things. And so it starts in the womb. And so that would be my best advice. Follow me and look through my guides. I have a whole guide dedicated to like bilingual parenting in the community that's on Instagram that I trust and people to follow. So you can go straight there. That would be kind of my my best advice. Yeah, thank you. That yeah. That is very valuable. So now we're going to shift gears just a little bit. I know that I didn't really ask a lot of questions about you and your motherhood experience as well as raising your children. I know that they're little, right? So you have mm -hmm. a three and a half and a two and a half year old. They're so cute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what still surprises you about being a mommy? How you can be your child. I mean, I just, my children, like I look at them and I just, can't believe that I created such beautiful like creatures like I'm just like <laughs> like I feel like they're just when you think about the awe feeling and like you know that warm and fuzzy feeling like it's crazy to me that I can look at my child even when they're having a meltdown at any point of the day and be like oh like I they came from me like I created every drop of them and so I feel like that you know, I, you, I, I guess I thought that once the newborn phase, like that kind of would have worn off a little bit, but I'm still just constantly like, wow, like what a miracle, what a blessing this is, this being a mom process, even when it's really hard. So that's kind of what shocks me that that feeling, it's almost like you're constantly in that feeling of bliss of, you know, bliss and love of your children. I also, I'm very surprised every day how much being a mommy made me reconnect to a different level to being Dominican. Like I mm. grew up in the Dominican Republic and I remember loving like being Dominican, but nothing compares to how much I love that I am Dominican until I became a mom. Yes. Like I it love this. was a game changer for me. It was like, I, I wanted to, I don't know, like it took, and so every day I'm just like, it's so crazy. Like how connected I feel to being Dominican by having made a little, two little Dominicans. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That is wonderful. Like I, I totally understand what you're saying because that, that was me. We were very intentional of having a doula that is also Mexicana. My parents mm -hmm. come from Mexico and I used the rebozo, which 
my mom didn't even use a rebozo during labor. And I was like, no, this is something that I, I want to use because my ancestors yeah. utilized, like even that little piece of cloth, right? Yeah. So it's interesting how like we, by being mothers, we're embracing our culture. We're not just mm -hmm. embracing ourselves, but our cultura as well, which oh, yeah. I love. Yeah, thank you I so much that. for sharing. Yeah, it's like, like I, I cook so much more, I'm more intentional, like so much, like my husband loves to cook. And so he always did used to do the cooking, but ever since we, we are in this journey. So almost for four years, I've been like, nope, like we, I want to make the traditional meals that I used to eat when I was little. And like, I want to be involved my child in it. And I want, I want it to be as if they are in the Dominican Republic by here. And so mm -hmm. it's, like we celebrate Noche Buena instead. Well, we celebrate Christmas too, but it's not like, yeah, know. it's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. And so it's not the same. So Noche Buena is like how I grew up. Like we celebrate that. And so my kids do too. And Los Reyes, like we do so much and I didn't expect that. It really shocked me. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this. And then what is one tip of advice you have for Latina mommies in general? For Latinas mommies, I would say don't be afraid to honor the whole you. So one mm -hmm. of the things that we have to remember is that especially Latina mommies living in the U.S., we are both. We are de aquí y de allá. And we, when we come into a space, we don't have to pick. We can be the whole us. We can, we don't have to be embarrassed if we don't know some random, you know, traditional American movie that we didn't grow up with. We don't have to be embarrassed by that. Or if we say something that's not like how other people would say it, we don't have to be afraid of that. We need to embrace and come into spaces honoring our full self, which is that we're bilingual, bicultural and a lot of times biracial and so that is who we are and we that's my best advice find ways to tap into your full self and heal whatever part of you isn't isn't doing or isn't feeling a hundred percent so that you can show up as your full self into all your spaces and teach your child to show up because they mm -hmm. are bilingual bicultural biracial a lot of times and we want them to feel that they can go anywhere they want and that their whole self is just as important and valued yes oh my gosh this is phenomenal it's like if i can drop this microphone i would do it for you <laughs> <laughs> that yes thank you so much for this great tip i really appreciate it we definitely need to model the way and mm -hmm. that way our kiddos can have this level of self-awareness self-advocacy self-love self yes yes exactly yeah um, because we are that 1.5 generation where we had yeah. we were kind of needing to figure out how do we exist in both worlds but our kids are the both worlds like yes. we already did that where we had to figure out how to exist and they now just get to exist so we need to nurture that so that they can just be their both both or three selves or four selves whoever they are they can just be and we're there to like kind of lead the way but yeah and then if I mean, I'm a therapist, so I'm going to say this to everybody. Then if you can do it on your own and if your community is not something that feels safe to do it with, then definitely reach out and seek therapy because in healing, we find we find peace and, and mental health is a practice. Bilingualism is a practice. Mental health is a practice. Mm -hmm. And we have to work yes. at it every day. Yes. Yeah. Love it. Thank you so much. You're and welcome. last question, yeah. I promise. I could um, be here all day, don't worry. I know, right? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> we can go on. Yeah. And so what is your meaning of madrehood? Ooh, this is a good one. You know, I think if I had to think about a meaning for motherhood, it would be vulnerability. Like, mm. I feel like motherhood is a season of life that will never actually end it is a it is it is it's going to be a permanent part of who I am and it doesn't matter how old or wise my children are 
there will be a level of mothering that will be instinctual for me, for me, you know, it'll, I'll always want to take care of them. I see that in my mom, that even though all her kids are in their thirties, she's still, you know, parenting and she's still mothering and my dad too still worries and still, you know, checks in. And so I think for me, motherhood, it's going, it's vulnerability and consistency. Mm. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, Deandra, where can people follow you? I know that we've mentioned your platform, but yeah, just for folks that are not familiar with you or your social media, where can they follow you? Yeah. So you guys can follow me on Instagram. It's bilingual playdate. All right. Perfect. And I'll make sure to share that in the notes as well as the other resources that we mentioned. But Deandra, thank you so much. This was so valuable and I'm sure it'll be very valuable for many, many mommies that are listening out here. I feel like so much of what you mentioned resonates to me and, and my beliefs as well. So yes, thank you for allowing space and, and building community through this platform as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's an honor. I'm so happy that you asked me to be on your podcast. It was such a great conversation and I'm happy that more mommies are going to be getting this information and feeling empowered to do bilingualism in the way that works for you, because Absolutely. that is what it's all about. The way that works for us and our family. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Viva La Mami podcast. If you like this episode, make sure to leave a review and write what episode really resonated with you. If you really loved it, share it on social media or with an amiga. As always, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you are listening. Make sure to follow me at Viva La Mami on Instagram or visit VivaLaMami.com. Please note the information shared in this podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be replaced by your healthcare provider nor taken as professional advice. <laughs>